Hi everyone, my name is Johnny Dark and I am a comedian. And I think it's appropriate that there is a comedian here today because President Abraham Lincoln, our 16th president, very much enjoyed humor and he used humor whenever and wherever he could. Which is why for me, a comedian, I've always found it so ironic that the last utterances ever heard by this rough man from Illinois would have been a joke and a mighty silly joke at that. It was delivered on stage on Good Friday evening, April 14th, 1865, at Ford's Theater in Washington, D.C., on 10th Street, just above E. Yet another comedian and actor, Harry Hawk, playing the part of Asa Trenchard in Laura Keene's production of Our American Cousin, delivers the joke. It comes soon after. Helen Truman, playing the part of Augusta, exits the stage in a comedic huff after a row with our hero, to be followed shortly thereafter by her irate and scheming mother, Mrs. Mount Chessington. The country bumpkin, Asa Trenchard, now stands on stage and is all alone, and he is quite amused. He slowly turns to the fourth wall and says to no one in particular in soliloquy, don't know the manner is a good society, huh? <laughs> well, I guess I know enough to turn you inside out, old gal. You sockdologizing old man trap. That was it. Now, out of context, I know that might not sound like a very funny joke, certainly dated. But when you put it in context and you know that these two highly sophisticated English women were trying to swindle this rube out of his huge inheritance. Well, then it works twofold. Not only as a fine joke, but as a terrific comeuppance. For you see, this here country boy was not as naive as they thought. Consequently, when Harry Hawk in character delivers this line, it is in a theatrical term, boppo, and creates a huge burst of laughter from the audience. Great for the playwright Tom Taylor not so great for the nation. For you see, this eruption was known to be coming by the intruder, and he would use this mask of fall to muffle the sound of his cowardly deed, which was undeniably horrifying and despicable and regrettably successful, plunging an already divided nation stricken with grief over four years of bloody conflict into a bitter and highly suspicious mourning period with a dubious and clumsy reconstruction to follow. And all because of a dissatisfied fellow countryman who would not listen to the better angels of his nature and wanted to avenge an unwitting South by removing not only the President of the United States, but the Secretary of State William H. Stewart and Vice President Andrew Johnson, who, coincidentally, just happened to be a Southerner. The scene enacted that night in Box 7 at Ford's Theater has forever tarnished a nation with its claim to fame as being the first time ever a president of the United States was assassinated. If only it were the last. Ironically, the last words spoken by the Lincolns to each other were when Mrs. Lincoln, with her guest Major Henry Rathbone and his beau Clara Harris just inches away, nestles up to her husband, whispering, my, 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 but what will Miss Harris think of my hanging on to you so? The president replied, if you won't think anything about it. They were, in fact, the last words spoken by the Lincolns to each other, this occurring just a little before 10 p.m., while the play was still early in Act Three. Soon after, would Car Harry Hawk and his now infamous line, you sockdologizing old man trap. <laughs> and what a line, sockdologizing. Is it even a word? Sad to think that a man of such eloquence in writing and speaking should go to his maker after hearing such a silly retort. Sad and ironic, and dare I say it, appropriate 
and comforting. It probably made him laugh. Because President Abraham Lincoln, our 16th president, very much enjoyed humor, and he used humor whenever and wherever he could, mostly in self-deprecation. Once, when a rival would say, Abraham Lincoln is two-faced, he would respond by saying, if I were two-faced, I don't think I'd be wearing this one. Often he would tell the story when as a boy chopping wood in Indiana, a woman came riding by on her horse ever so slowly, and she stopped, and she looked at him, and she said, my, 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 but land sakes alive, child. You are the homeless boy I have ever seen. You are ugly. Young Abraham said, well, ma'am, there ain't much I can do about that. And the woman said, well, you could have stayed at home. <laughs> home for the very young Abraham Lincoln would have been a cabin in the Kentucky wilderness where on February 12, 1809, he was born. Just two years and two days after his sister Sarah. There they resided with their parents, Thomas Lincoln and Nancy Hanks Lincoln, at a place near Knob Creek and Sinking Springs Farm, just three miles southwest of Hogginville, Kentucky. Their cabin was located right alongside the old Cumberland Trail, which ran from Louisville to Nashville. And where, as a boy, the future chief executive could listen to the yarns and the tall tales of the travelers and witness the grimness of slaves being driven south to be sold. The Lincolns were part of a fundamental Baptist group that very much opposed slavery, which might account for his opposition to it as well. He always said, I have never not been anti-slavery. In 1816, Thomas Lincoln, after disputes over the ownership of his land and the death of a third child in infancy, little Thomas Jr., he packed up his family and left the slave state of Kentucky for the even deeper wilderness of southern Indiana, Pigeon Creek, Indiana to be exact, in Perry County, now Spencer County, and where they had to literally cut out a path that the land that Thomas Lincoln claimed and then carve out a piece of that in which they might build themselves a home. It was at this time, at the age of seven years old, that Abraham Lincoln had an ax placed into his hands, seemingly never to be taken out. The clearing of the surplus wood was the great task ahead, and I, though very young, was large for my age, and had an ax placed into my hands at once. And from that to within my 23rd year have almost constantly been handling that most useful instrument. Their nearest neighbor was over a mile away. They were alone and they were isolated. And at night around their half-faced camp, nothing more than a rough shelter with no flooring enclosed on just three sides, they would huddle around the fire where they could hear distinctively the menacing sounds of the howling of the wolves, the screams of the panthers, and the foraging of the big bears for food. It was for all concerned, unsettling. In spite of these hardships, in spite of these carnivorous critters, the family went about the business of building themselves a home. And in just a little while, thanks to the kindness and the help of their neighbors, they erected a sturdy little cabin they got by that first year mostly by hunting, subsisting on bear meat and deer meat. And with even little Abraham Lincoln chipping in a mite right before his eighth birthday in February when he shot and killed a turkey. But it was something he could never do again. Killing was not for him. I have not since pulled a trigger on any larger game. Life on the prairie was desperately lonely and isolated, but it was worse. It was volatile, and in a split second could be extremely dangerous. Abraham Lincoln was named after his father's father, Abraham Lincoln Sr., a Virginia farmer turned Kentucky farmer and a distant relative to the great Daniel Boone. In 1786, 
Abraham Lincoln Sr. and his three sons, Mordecai, Josiah, and Thomas Lincoln were out in their field planting corn when they were suddenly ambushed by Indians. Abraham Lincoln Sr. was killed right off. Mordecai, the oldest boy at 15, sent his younger brother Josiah running back to the settlement a half a mile away for help as he ran back to the cabin. Once inside the cabin, he could see through cracks in the logs that an Indian had come out of the woods and was now creeping up upon his younger brother Thomas, just eight years old, still sitting and weeping next to the body of his dead father. Mordecai grabbed his musket and on a run cocked it and aimed it directly at a silver pennant on that Indian's chest, fired and killed him instantly, thus saving the life of Abraham Lincoln's father, Thomas Lincoln. Such was life on the prairie, where all you could expect was the unexpected. And from 1817 to 1818, the unexpected turned out to be, well, that nothing much happened. It was a fairly benign year. Quite to the contrary, actually, when Nancy Hanks Lincoln was even cheered up a mite when her uncle and aunt Thomas Sparrow and Elizabeth Hanks Sparrow, along with their illegitimate nephew Dennis Hanks, all moved to within just a few miles of the Lincoln household, even staying at their half-faced camp while their place was being readied. So now, although life on the prairie was desperately lonely and volatile and dangerous and rugged, suddenly, with kin nearby, it had become tolerable for a while. Then things hit a sour note. First, Abraham had a very serious accident. One of his many jobs was to take corn down to Gordon's mill to be ground into meal. On this particular day, he took along their old mare, and he hitched that mare up to the arm of a grist mill. And because it was late, and he was anxious to get home, he gave that mare a few strokes with the whip. That mare buckled and lashed out at him, kicking him right into the forehead. He fell to the ground, bleeding and unconscious, and everyone thought he was dead. They sent for his father. And after what seemed an interminable time, the boy was finally revived. And although he could not talk for several hours, he nevertheless recovered without any permanent damage. But it was a harbinger of things to come. In 1818, as the cows grazed upon the poisonous white snake root, a terrible illness known as the milk sick swept into Indiana, into Pigeon Creek, right into the Lincoln household. Among the first to die were Nancy Hanks' uncle and aunt Thomas Sparrow and Elizabeth Hanks Sparrow. Old Tom Lincoln would have to carve out rude coffins in which to bury them both in. Poor Nancy Hanks Lincoln barely had time to grieve before she herself was afflicted and after an arduous struggle knew she was dying as well. She called her children to her bedside and she told them, to be good and kind to your father, to one another and to the world. And then, on October 5th, in Pigeon Creek, Indiana, in 1818, Nancy Hanks Lincoln died. She was just 34 years old, leaving behind a grieving husband and her two grieving and devastated children. And a young Abraham, just nine years old, left to deal with the debilitating depression that would haunt him for the rest of his life, bringing him on occasions, his friends would say, right to the brink of contemplating suicide. Her death for him was a wound of the heart that never healed. She was my angel mother. All that I am or hope you ever to be, I owe to her. Thomas Lincoln, alone and quite miserable, unable to cope with the rearing of two children, 
left them in the care of young cousin Dennis Hanks, just 20 years old, and got himself back to Kentucky to seek himself a wife. Six months later, he returned with Sarah Bush Johnston, a widow with three small children of her own, Matilda, Elizabeth, and John D. Johnson. Their ages ranging between four and nine. The new Mrs. Lincoln went right to work, cleaning up and organizing the bedraggled little family, ingratiating them amongst each other without the slightest hint of favoritism or jealousy. With her solidarity, benevolence, and genuine common sense, she soon had her household up and running smoothly in no time at all. And for this, she received from them all not only their devotion, but their everlasting love and affection. Sarah Bush Johnston loved all her children, but she would admit later she was partial to Abraham. I have never given him a crossword in all my life. His mind and mine, what little I had, seemed to move together. Move together in the same channel. Years later, when comparing her son to her stepson, she would say, both were good boys, but I must say now, both being dead. Abraham was the best boy I ever saw. Or ever expect to see. All that can be said about his feelings towards her was that no man ever loved the mother more. He called her mama. Sarah Bush Johnston may have just saved Abraham Lincoln's life. She got him out of the doldrum, she curbed his fatalism, and she instilled in him self-esteem by encouraging him to learn wherever and whenever he could. All told, the boy only had was less than one year of formal schooling, if you can call Andrew Crawford's Blab School a formal school. That's where children just recite their lessons aloud to their schoolmaster. No, he was self-taught and he taught himself how to read and write. And he loved to read. He would say, my best friend is any man that get me a book I haven't read. And he read everything he can get his hands on. Aesop's Fables, Shakespeare, Weems' Life of Washington, The Kentucky Preceptor, Pilgrim's Progress, The Life of Benjamin Franklin, and The Arabian Nights. His cousin Dennis Hanks would say, oh, that Arabian Nights ain't nothing but a pack of lies. Young Abraham would say, mighty fine lies, though, no? mighty fine. Those years under Sarah Bush Johnson's tutelage were perhaps the happiest of Abraham Lincoln's life. He described it as a happy, joyful boyhood filled with mirth and glee, nothing sad nor pinched, and nothing of want. Under Sarah Bush Johnston's roof, Abraham Lincoln grew in mind, in spirit, and most definitely in body. Six feet, four inches tall, 214 pounds, all arms, all legs, gangly as all get out and strong. He could whip any man in wrestling, in horseshoes, or weightlifting, and he was a sight to behold. The perfect rube, the typical country bumpkin, if you will. And yet, when he spoke, there was an eloquence about him that those listening knew that here, in fact, was a thinker. On January 20th of 1828, the family was dealt yet another blow with the death of Sister Sarah Lincoln in childhood. Abraham Lincoln always blamed her husband, Aaron Grinsby, and his family for not summoning a doctor sooner. The death of Sister Sarah Lincoln in 1828 caused a huge rift between the two families, and was also the motivating factor behind a practical joke that Abraham Lincoln would play on the Grimsby brothers when they were married jointly. He was somehow able to maneuver the brides into the wrong bedchamber. And then he would lampoon the whole incident in an essay written in biblical language entitled The Chronicles of Reuben. But more importantly, the death of Sister Sarah Lincoln in 1828 solidified the fact that it was now time for Abraham Lincoln to think about leaving home. For honestly, he wanted nothing more to do with his father. He wasn't gonna be anything like his father. He wasn't gonna be a dirt farmer or a carpenter. And in 1828, the same year Sarah died, 
An opportunity came his way when local store owner James Gentry offered him $8 a month to take a flatboat loaded with cargo down the Mississippi River for New Orleans along with his son Alan Gentry. Now this was more like it and Abraham Lincoln jumped at the chance and all in all it turned out to be a mighty fine experience. Although one night while docked the little flatboat was boarded by seven Negroes intent on killing and robbing the boys. And although they were both hurt in the fracas, they were able to run off these Negroes, get undocked, and back on that 1,200 mile trip down the Mississippi River for New Orleans. Abraham Lincoln had never seen a big city, and he had never seen anything like New Orleans. And he was flabbergasted, awestruck, amazed, befuddled. The sub, the hubbub, the, the sights, I mean, it was incredible to him. And here again, he saw slaves, only this time chained and shackled and sold at auction to the highest bidder. The sight of human beings buying and selling other human beings was a memory that was never quite erased from the mind of Abraham Lincoln and only served to reinforce his absolute hatred for the institution of slavery. In 1830, at the age of 21 and for the last time. Abraham Lincoln will fulfill his duties to his father and his stepmother by once again helping them move, this time from Spencer County, Indiana to Macon County, Illinois. He would load up the wagons and even drove the oxen. And when they got to Illinois, he helped his father break up the ground, fence off the land and build their cabin. And then after an arduous winter of snow, sleet, and blizzards, everyone down sick with AU, that spring, Abraham Lincoln left home for good without ever looking back, rarely to see his father again. That was a strange, friendless, uneducated, penniless boy, a piece of floating driftwood. That driftwood would wind up snagged along the Sagamon River at a new settlement just two years old, known as New Salem, Illinois. It's here in New Salem where Abraham Lincoln would find his voice, his first love, and his calling. But before he could find anything, he needed to find himself a job. Luckily or unluckily, he had come in contact with a none too scrupulous businessman by the name of Denton Offit, who offered him $10 a month to take yet another flatboat back down the Mississippi River loaded with cargo for New Orleans, this time with his cousin John Hanks and his stepbrother John D. Johnston. And all in all, it turned out to be another fine experience. When he got back to New Salem, he was supposed to go right to work for Denton Offit at a new store, but that wasn't ready to be opened. So, Abraham Lincoln needed to find odd jobs in order to stay alive. He did a little bit of everything. Riverboat man, carpenter, farmer, rail splitter, even worked in a still for a while. And then in September of that year, Denton Offit's store was open and Abraham Lincoln became his chief clerk. Mr. Offit was mighty impressed with Abraham Lincoln and he would brag on him to his customers about his wit and his intelligence and his storytelling. But mostly, he would brag about his physical strength, how his young clerk, Abraham Lincoln, could whip any man at anything at any time. Well, some of these compliments fell on the ears of a group of rowdy toughs who specialized in gander pulling, cockfighting, whiskey drinking, and who on a whim could destroy a man's store just for the fun of it. They were a group of ruffians known as the Clary Grove Boys, and they had suddenly taken an interest in Abraham Lincoln. Not because of his wit or his intelligence or even his storytelling, but they did want to test his physical strength and they challenged him to a wrestling match with their leader, the stalwart Jack Armstrong. Abraham Lincoln wanted nothing to do with wrestling, but did not want to be deemed a coward either. So he took him up on a challenge and the match was on. And by all accounts, it was indeed a mighty one how Jack Armstrong had beaten Abraham Lincoln but by cheating leg him. But what really happened, Abraham Lincoln pinned Jack Armstrong to the ground and then stood up over his body and made to take on all comers just one at a time. The offer was rejected. 
not so much because these boys were afraid of Abraham Lincoln, but because they had suddenly taken a liking to him. And no one had taken a bigger liking to Abraham Lincoln than their leader, Jack Armstrong. And soon these boys would become his most loyal and enthusiastic supporters, as well as being some of his best friends. We will continue with part two right here on this channel. So uh, I hope you look for it. And uh, remember, my name is Johnny Dark, and it's been a thrill talking to you about my favorite subject, Abraham Lincoln. Thank you very much.